Uh, the very first work we did when we got um, a, a small Mac in the studio and um, a dot matrix printer. Um, so again, technology changes the way we work. Um, and I'm not saying, again, digital shit. What I'm saying is we need to expand our experience in digital. When you're on a website, you don't have the sense of consecutiveness. You don't have juxtaposition. You don't have where one page can lead to another page, and it's a different way of telling the story, and there's, there's a flow and there's a journey to consider. So on this one, um, this is a, a feature about Madonna with the large M and the small photo of Madonna next to the headline. And then the following months, we reused some of those things to make a point about Andy Warhol. So there was the idea of using the presentation and the layout itself as part of the expression. Um, it's almost performative in a way, but we've lost that sense of performance. And we do have the opportunity, I, I, I hope it will start to come back in some form, but the idea that the way we present content should be responsive. It's not just a CMS and you drop in your image and your headline and your text. Um, and then it all scales down to mobile or up to um, a desktop screen. I think we need to be experimenting a lot more with, with the fluidity of the platform itself. Um, Hand-drawn headlines for Mademoiselle magazine, record covers where just f focusing on experimental iconic statements, um, exploring physical techniques looking at ritual as an idea for putting graphics together. Um, the fish here were made of um, um, coat hangers that were bent to form something, then pushing it through another process and another process. And we could do all of this with Photoshop, of course. Um, but this, it's the unexpected, I think, that keeps the humanity in, in work. Uh, the very first work we did when we got um, a, a small Mac in the studio and um, a dot matrix printer. Um, so again, technology changes the way we work. Uh, historically, this has always happened. Painting changed at the end of the 19th century because of the advent of the camera. And the, the camera did two things. One, it said, um, you don't need to shoot portraits or paint portraits or fantasy um, or imagination or religion anymore because the camera can probably do a faster, better, more accurate job. So that then liberated art into becoming um, exploratory and looking at things that went beyond the factual representation of, of society. And it did something else as well. It, it, it introduced cropping. Um, and it allowed people to imagine then, actually, we can crop. Things don't have to be central all the time. And we can also capture movement and motion. And um, we can also capture everyday life. So there was no blurring that, because previously you'd have to pay a painter, you'd have to sit in the studio. But the camera allowed a much more serendipitous way of thinking about representation. So the same has always happened with technology. Um, Printing, um, the affordability of, of making records allowed that whole record industry boom to happen. And I'm taking a bit of time on, on this front section just because there's some themes that will pop up as I'm pushing through some other stuff. But for me, um, seeing design as something that was maybe more poetic or more based on, on a kind of a, a visual jazz, as it were, where there's a set of rules, grids, things that we know, tools that we understand how to use, and then push that into an, uh, a performative or an expressive response and allow unexpected things to happen. And I think it's all about that. It's all about creating a structure or a platform to deliver and then 
putting some randomizers in that. I was always influenced by William Burroughs, of course, and his idea was that, with Brian Geisen, was that we can't just sit and think of something new. We need tools that can do that. So he would take a book, slice pages through the middle, and combine two halves. And then, as an author, would, would seamlessly join the, the lines to create um, phrases, sentences, pages. The soft machine, for instance, was almost completely written that way. And I put, brought a lot of that into the way I work. And I think we need to be introducing these um, tools that create a lack of predictability. Uh, this was the first colour work that we did and shipped it. It took all night. R, G, B as separate um, files um, as on a modem to Japan, um, and it cost thousands of pounds. But it was just unbelievable that we could send this file, and then by the time we'd got up the next morning, it had been printed in Japan. And now we think nothing of this, but at, at that time it was shocking. Um, and this is something uh, from 2010 where trying to bring that physical digital thing together um, using handmade prints and then combining them digitally. And for a while we were doing some experimenting with coding, looking at how, how can we make digital more fluid. And graphic design and, and language is a very fluid space and it needs to be fluid because it needs to adapt and adjust and engage. Um, Otherwise, it becomes a fixed format, and language is really influential in terms of the way we think and communicate, because it not only is a delivery system for ideas and content and objects and instructions, but it's also, in doing so, a, a limitation. Um, what you can't say in words doesn't get said, and what you can't say digitally doesn't get communicated. So. How do we keep breaking that down and allowing new possibilities to happen? We did explore that a lot with uh, Fuse, which I can't show today um, because we've got a very tight time slot. But with Fuse, we looked at the idea that language is a way of enabling um, communication and ideas and allowing new things to happen. And with this coding idea, um, and with AI now, this is quite easy to, to prompt. Um, but the fact is, and I've said it before, that um, digital form is, is never fixed. It's always fluid. 